Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so uh, the next speaker, uh, Rob Gillen, needs no introduction because he was just introduced in the previous thing in the panel. But he's from Oak Ridge Labs, and uh, he's been uh, doing some interesting things with Azure and looking at a lot of problems from the National Laboratory's point of view. Was, the, the original email I got said this is a 30-minute talk, and then I got here on on was it Thursday, and the slide said talks are limited to 20 minutes. I cringed, and then I realized that the panel precedes in this, so I'm just sort of going to count that as my introduction. So we're just going to roll right in here. Um, <clears throat> so there, I want to talk about two main topics or two topics sort of on the, uh, under the umbrella of data in the cloud. To give a little bit of context, we've been working on a project specifically focused on this. We are, um, if, you, uh, just, if you don't know much about Oak Ridge Mass Laboratory, we do a lot of computation, like a lot meaning we have both the first and third in the top 500 list supercomputers sitting on the floor, and we're currently putting in our third petascale machine. So we're, we do lots of computation. All of those bad things we heard about in the, in the first opening keynote where they talk about MPI and Fortran and C++, that's all we do. So <laughs> I am the, <laughs> I'm just probably the, the fish out of water in that group, but we do a lot of work with that, lots of tightly coupled simulation, though we also do lots of other areas of science. I tend, in, in other audiences, I tend to say we, we cover all areas of science, but then I've been told that that's technically incorrect and I get in trouble for saying that, so we do lots of science. So biology to neutron scattering to Take your pick. We do lots of different things. Our specific interest in cloud computing is how does it fit into our um, into our computational profile, specifically in what we define as mid-range computing. And because our definition may be different than yours, we define that as anywhere as computing where the problems need between 256 and 1,000 nodes. So that's sort of that's our middle bounds for computational profiles. And it's a multi-year project. The first year we're focusing specifically on data, and this is sort of some, some thoughts and common comments that come out of that. And we, like I said, the first, first aspect we're going to talk about is movement. There's, there's two main topics, movement and then data services. So movement, we're focusing on, on sort of three paradigms. They're very, very simple. One is if we have computation hosted locally at our facility, and we're accessing data that's hosted in the cloud. The second being the reverse of that. We actually have some massive data sets, sort of petascale size. And if we wanted to make those, we we're sort of looking at the case, what if we want to make those available to the cloud for maybe third parties or other people who are doing computation there. The third case, which is very easy, or easiest of the, of the three, is scenarios where both computation and data live in the same cloud. And while there are multiple cloud providers out there, we've been focusing our efforts on the two that are represented here, both Amazon and Microsoft, and playing with different keys there. And I will, <clears throat> probably unlike most, I am more of a Microsoft coder by definition, so I, our samples will lean that way a little bit, though we've been working with both. We came across something that I know is going to amaze you all. Um, the internet is slow. So... And to put, a, put this in context, we live, Oak Ridge is, ha, has sort of a uniquely, a uniquely fortuitous network connectivity. We, there's national sort of, a lot of academic networks that sort of make a loop of, around the country. And then there's this big fat pipe that goes from Atlanta, Chicago, and it bends directly through our building. So we have multiple 10 gig connections, a couple of 40 gig connections. We're in the process of putting a 100 gig connection. To the, to, the, to the internet through, right through our building. So we have significant bandwidth. And in, so in that context, as we're studying things, we're trying to keep things in perspective, right? So things that may work for us may not work for other people. people things that work at our lab may not work for that, that typical scientist we were talking about earlier in the panel or at a research institute or a collegiate institution or things like that. So we're looking at different scenarios. And 
one of the biggest things we, you know, we started off with some very simple baselining and parameter sweeps. We started off by generating a bunch of data of different file sizes and then doing parameter sweeps of those file sizes both up and down, going to Amazon's cloud, going from our place to Azure's cloud, doing downloads, and then doing intra-cloud co communications. And probably one of the most significant things that sort of came up and is more educational, not so much from my standpoint coming from industry and the internet, but for our researchers, they were caught off guard a little bit having spent most of their time in working in local networks was the variance that the cloud in, or variance that the internet introduces. So the next two slides um, sort of hint at this. And this is upload duration by file size showing one standard deviation. And this is comparing the same, same profile of us against Amazon, or us, Microsoft against Amazon coming from our labs. And the key here is not to say, well, Amazon's better or Microsoft's better because it's less variance. Or that, those are sort of irrelevant to the point. The point is that there's a lot of variance. And there's a number of factors that play into it. This next slide actually illustrates it much more. This is a very non-intuitive variance pattern. And this, there is not a, there's a big fancy scientific reason for why this happens. It's called network congestion. Right? It has nothing to do with the science, nothing to do with the bits. It has everything to do with the fact that we ran our test sequentially. We worked from one file size all the way up. And when we hit this file size, it happened to hit a blip. Right? There happened to be other traffic on the network that interacted with it that caused things to slow down. That's, that's the reason. And that's a very key and important thing for researchers if you're doing sort of this, this detached or segregated computation where you've got computation disjoint from your data, say in the cloud, to take into account in your, in your computation and in your, in your patterns. So again, stating the obvious probably that's from this is you want to put your data as close to your compute as you can. It's, that's sort of an obvious known statement. Um, but we, we, there are still cases where we think that, this, that we, there may be too expensive to move data. And as you can see, we did parameter sweeps from 2K all the way up to a gig. So there are, this is not just moving massive files, it's moving small files simultaneously in parallel across things. So we spent some time looking at this and, and came up with, again, a somewhat obvious but, um, but yet effectual statement is that um, multi-threaded downloads or file transfers make significant impacts, right? So again, something that may not be as intuitive to classical HPC people is that moving data across the internet, doing multi-threaded transfers can, can provide some interesting improvements. So essentially what we did is we wrote some, we wrote some, we adjusted the libraries and test harnesses that we had earlier to say, rather than just opening up a socket and pulling a file down, give me, first of all, acquiesce or ascertain what the file size is, split it into n number of parts, open up that number of threads and pull it down. And we did parameter sweeps for all of the file sizes as well as for the number of concurrent threads. For downloads, that's very easy because both of the both providers and most do pro provide HTTP interfaces that support byte ranges. So you can simply do a, give me a byte range for this. So it, different threads working on different byte ranges. That was very easy. The upload was actually much harder. And the so what we did is we sort of we looked at the different API styles and the things supported by the different providers, and we sort of stole an implementation idea from Microsoft. So. Amazon's S, you know, their S3 thing, when you want to put up a blob, you basically open up a pipe, say, here's all my data, go, 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 close it, finalizes, and you've put your data. Very standard file upload. Microsoft does the exact same thing until you hit a limit of 64 megs. Anything above 64 megs, they require you to, to break it up into blocks. Somewhere, I think each block has to be less than 4 megs. And you basically, you can issue a number of, of puts, and then like they demonstrated the other day, once you get them all up there, you do a commit, you say, here's my list, commit that, and it assembles into a file. Now, the beauty of the Microsoft approach is it allows us to do sub-file parallelization. So we can actually put one, we can transfer one file and do it in parallel, do parallel threads. The, what we did th then is to, so we could sort of compare things similarly, is we established a data proxy so we, we took and basically built our own data service, deployed it both to Microsoft and to, and to, or to Azure and to S3, 
or EC2 in this case. And that the point of that data service would be to allow it to behave very much like Microsoft's blob storage does in that it allows block transfer. It does a couple of additional things in that it allows us to do um, um, CRC checks on each block as well as doing um, adaptive compression on each block. So as we're, doing, as we're doing our transfers, we would do selective compression on each block and then do the reassembly on the, on the, on the client side, or on the, excuse me, on the server side. And then, do, then, then optionally, we would transfer that file from the, from the compute location over the storage location. And what we saw was, um, well, sort of what you'd expect. We saw some pretty amazing performance increases. This is actually the download direction. So even for, for a second thread, we saw stuff easily in 100 or pushing double percentages all the way up to over 800% performance improvements for transferring stuff. And again, that's because we're taking advantage of sort of, if you will, weaknesses in the internet and the way things work and opening up pipes. So one of the conversations or the topics that sort of we want to throw out is, this all works and this is great, but if I'm a scientist or if I'm, if I'm trying to consume one of these cloud services, we view this as an area that needs significant work. In, in neither of these cases were, were the local disks or the target disks the, the gating factor. It wasn't local network, it wasn't local memory or CPU, nor was it remote CPU or, or remote memory. It's simply the interconnects between them. So we're, we're sort of focusing our own efforts internally and also sort of making a call forward is how do, we, how do we solve this problem? Why can't, if I've got a gig connection at my network or a gig connection at my facility and there's Amazon or Microsoft has a gig connection in their place and neither are full, why can't I use as much as is, is available, right? Why can't I get closer to saturating that network pipe? So that's, that's a bit, an area of, of significant improvement or that we're looking to see and would sort of call upon the community to, to work on and focus on. Um, Second topic is services, and this is um, sort of follows on to the conversation or one of the points that we made earlier is when we, I, I think we need to step and look when we're talking about cloud computing, talking about what it's good for and how does it augment our computational platform. One of those areas it, that's sort of natural is that of data distribution and data sharing. And there's, there's a lot of reasons and discussions as to why that should be. Um, our facility does a lot of data distribution. We do a lot. We host a bunch of the IPCC data for the climate stuff. And we, I did a little digging as to how that works. And there's actually this big, massive tape library. And there's a web page you go to. And you select. You, you can go through catalogs, select things. You check a box. It submits a job that goes to the tape library, moves it over to a computer. You get an email with a download link that's good for an hour or something, you'd pull it down and so forth. It works, but it feels very arcane, very difficult to move. And what I'm getting in that case is I'm getting a bunch of net CDF files, which if you're a domain scientist or you work in that space, you know what that is and you know how to work with it and that's fine. If you're not, you look at the file and you say, what's this? And if all you wanted to really know was for a given point in time, what was the temperature for this lat-long combination? You've done an awful lot of work, and you still have an awful lot of long way to go to get that answer, right? You have to find libraries to, to interact with it, which certainly they are there. But then you've downloaded this gig file for roughly a K's worth of information that you need. So we saw earlier a conversation about, um, about Dallas, and there's, there's some really interesting things not necessarily from a product standpoint, but conceptually what they're trying to do. They're taking a data service and they're saying, what, one of their key selling points, if you will, is we're going to provide a co commonality across all of these data services. We're going to provide a similar interface, whatever, it's be, whatever it may be. In their case, it's um, OData, which gives you both JSON, JSONP optionally, and um, Atom Pub. And as we looked at that, we're playing with, it, playing with it. We actually did some work with, I don't know if it's technically accurate to say a predecessor to Dallas, um, but it's called OGDI, which is the Open Government Data Initiative, which is an SDK that was put together by Microsoft's DPE group out of Microsoft Federal in DC. Basically, the same notion of Dallas, just less polished and didn't have all of the magic corporate sponsor behind, 
behind it. Same ideas, though. We did some kicking around with it. And again, stating a brilliant um, observation, science-friendly formats don't often or often don't equal internet-friendly formats. When we think about internet-friendly formats, we're thinking about um, AtomPub, XML, things that are easily consumed, JSON, things that people can, while they probably wouldn't want to make a steady diet of it, they can open up a text browser or something and see it and consume it and sort of grok what the data is. If we look on the, on the other hand, sort of scientific formats, um, FASTA maybe being a, an exception to this, but, but even that's sort of a little weird to look at. Um, NetCDF in particular, you get this big, this big hierarchy of, of binary data, and without the proper tools, there's no way to dig into it. So we did some experiments. We took, we took a couple of NetCDF files and tried to publish them through to the internet and say, okay, if we wanted to make this available as a service, ignoring by, by choice the whole open DAP approach and what's sort of accepted, because again, that's, oh, that's domain specific within a realm. We were trying to say, if we want to take just a, an internet friendly approach completely down the road. Again, we saw some, some amazingly, I guess, blatant or expected results in that well, let's stepping back. We took a slice of, of data, which was all of the temperatures for a given point in time across the across the globe for a given based on their grid, which is I think a five degree grid, ended up being somewhere in the order of eighty two hundred data points. Each data point consisting of a timestamp, lat long, and a temperature value. So not much data. As as aggregated with, amongst the larger net CDF file, it was a K or a couple of K's worth of data. We when you flatten that to, net, to a CSV file, if you will, and then stream it across, you're talking about a couple hundred K worth of data. When we moved it and exposed it as an Atom Pub service, um, it got really big. So that same 8,200 records, so if you want to look particularly at the first and the third lines, that same 8,200 records became almost nine megs of XML coming down the line. Now there's an obvious problem here in that the data services at that time, I don't think they still do in Azure, don't support native compression or compression automatically. So you don't get HTTP compression on your, on your transfers yet. There's, if I understand right, there's work coming there. But right now it's just giving you the raw XML, which as we all know, raw XML is very bloated. JSON is better but it's still, it's still pretty significant compared to the original, which was actually I don't have on the chart. Um, so the payload got very, very big. So I guess the, again, stating future work here as well as sort of a call to the community is to put, at, as we, as we, as an industry or as a, as a research community adopt cloud computing and adopt cloud computing strategies for distribution of data and so forth, I'd like to see us move towards consistency across the protocols that we, we distribute, the protocols that we use. There's certainly a, a justification and a valid reason for binary, or if you will, for their native formats, but I think it's incumbent along with those, at least in my semi-perfect view of the world, for the notion of broad distribution of data is with every, if you're going to distribute data in the native formats, you should, it should be associated with sort of more internet friendly formats. So I can get it in both ways or e either way I'd like it to. And ideally in a format, or a, expose it as a service that will adapt based on my calls. So if I, I use the same URN, URI endpoints and basically pass flags that say maybe I want it as JSON or Atom Pub, maybe I'm playing with a small data set and I want to see what things and have a very easy way to interact with it. And then maybe as I'm moving down the chain or as I've figured out what I want, I pass a different flag and I get the same results that are a larger result set in a more friendly format for that particular thing. I think there needs to be work in the area of, of binary XML and some standards around that line wherein we can express formats that have some of, some of the richness, if you will, of Atom Pub, because Atom Pub is great for a lot of things in that it's self-describing, it's richly and easily consumed by a number of, number of clients. But, does, but So we need to shoot for formats that have those qualities without having the encumbrances of being overly bloated. Um, so that's the future work. Things in sort of the last statement, and this sort of goes to the overall thing, is 
I think it's incumbent on us as researchers as we're using the cloud and we're looking at ways, how does it change what we're doing to be a little more open with the data that we're, that we're developing or data that we're publishing. I was reading, working through some papers and some research or some, some papers that I was editing for somebody else and they made some very audacious claims with very little data to back it up. I think one of the things that the, the internet provides us is the ability to, to link large data sets with those results and to publish those concurrently, allowing people to do that validation. We sort of hit, hinted at that in some of the other conversations. Um, and I guess it's just, I think we can do better as a community. I think we can provide that proof and provide th that data such that a broad community of people can consume and use it. That's it. So I think uh, you, you sort of hit on, I mean, one of the reasons why these binary formats sort of persist is that there's this ridiculous kind of explosion when you try to use something richer. Yes. And I think one of, I think that's somewhat fundamental because of the unit of, of like the atomic unit of work inside of the data sets is sort of really big. You know, a single yes. time step of the simulation just to draw one image yes. can be made, right? And so if you actually want to draw that locally, because that's what you're doing, it's sort of anti visualization algorithms. We actually need to download that many again. So exploding up to a gig because it's X and L that would make all the sense. Right. So I guess I, I guess I was wondering is, is 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 there a way to make science friendly internet friendly rather than make rather than take internet friendly and use it more for science? Well, that, I what guess if the, that, what that's the browser the, was equipped with an SCDF parser or something. If every if every scientific domain used CD, net CDF, sure. And that's that's the point, right? So Adam Pub it I guess what I'm the point I'm making is much the same way that Atom Pub has sort of become very widely adopted across, you know, if you look at protocols like OData and GData and a lot of these things, that, that approach is very broadly, broadly used, right? And, and it's almost, it's sort of being used in science slightly backhanded coming from industry and from the larger group. I'd like to see, right, I'd, the point is I'd like to see us take that same notion, whether it's at Atom Pub or some variant, but provided it in a in a binary format, so it's it's domain discipline agnostic. Like, I guess I guess the you know, I don't I'm not trying to defend the, the SCDF or the CS database first whatever, but I think if they were they would say that they are domain agnostic, that they are they don't have just because oceanographers can use it more than other domains, other things can depend on the survey or other data or something. Right. Like they're just arrays or it's multi-dimensional. Yes. Like, so. But if you're not a scientist, do you have any idea what an SCDF file? Not, not even a domain society, but if you're not, if but you're... You, well, if you're not a scientist, do you have any idea what a multidimensional array is? Like, that, that's what they would yeah. say is their, their data. Yeah, so that's what they would say that their model is just multidimensional arrays, and so we can understand those. Anyway. Yeah, it's, whether it's that or, I, I think the, it's, whether it's a, the, the development of a new format, or an, adapt, an adaptation of another one, or simply the public, the, let's say the, the popularization of existing formats. I think there, there's work that could be done in a number of different ways there. Because I don't frankly care what the format is, so long as it's broadly available and sort of to a large populace, not just that 1% of people who know what MPI is, right? Yes. Uh, did, you, did you guys take a look at any, any sort of fan optimization techniques? So things, you know, sciences or things like Astara or things like We did not. Yeah. We, we sort of acknowledge that they were there and were specifically looking around them. Uh, again, thinking more of the, the generic consumer, you know, both, assu both assessing what's currently out there, but also looking at what that generic consumer would have expo exposure to access to. So when you compare <coughs> zero with their, um, uh, S3, do they have idea of the geolocation of S3 and S3? Yeah, so, yeah, I didn't go into that very well. The, I, I, I really wanted people not to look at the fact that one was better than the other because there are about 300 different reasons for that. Um, we did, I took them, I sort of ran up to our network guys and said, look at this, why? And there, we're connected both to Internet2 and ESNet and we actually saw that because of the way Microsoft uses um, Akamai, the Southern Crossing, which is one of the net, big network providers, advertises their router, they do a lot of sort of chatty advertising on the, on the routers for say, everything Microsoft come this way, which is not actually the best route for us to get to Azure. 
right? So, the, so our traffic to Azure was actually taking a prefer, performance hit because of sort of other things on the net. And that's actually one of the key things that we took away from that is it's not just, you know, there's, there's a, a plethora of things that you have to work through to get sort of that optimal network transfer that most people would, who traditionally live inside a given data center wouldn't think of. Right, so it's not, the, the point of that was to show the variance and the fact that there was some really odd things happening, not, I've been very careful not to say, well, this is better, this is better. It's, it's the, the deltas between the two that are really And good. actually, we've, got, we've had some experience with people in research institutes with big fat pipes, sending data to us with big fat pipes, and it totally depends on how that stuff in the middle gets out. It does. It does. There's lots of magic to work right now. It's interesting, because I instantly thought of BitTorrent when you were talking about the multi-threaded, and that was supposed to solve the pop the, um, bottleneck. But what you're saying is basically maybe the bottleneck has been in the network this whole time. But I mean, maybe you can talk to how so, so BitTorrent is really So Am Amazon actually has has support for BitTorrent coming down. So if you're using, which is which is novel in some ways, if I'm using, say we've just done a big run of climate data and I have I'm tasked with distributing it across the world and I've got lots of people pulling the same data at the same time then that model is really great, right? Because in theory, because BitTorrent only works well if there's lots of people seeding. If you're the only person pulling the data, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? So, so it's, it's interesting in that. And in what BitTorrent really does is presumably some of those people who are seeding are closer to you than the actual source of the data, right? And if, if, if you actually are closer to the, to the actual source, you're not going to see the benefit from the, from the seeds coming from other people. I think one of the significant things is your use of the parallel parallel streams in any case, in other words, the routing yep. makes a huge difference. It yeah. does. And is that piece of software available? It will, it will be. It will be. It will be. It's just, okay. and the, the point there, though, is yes, I, I sort of, we came up with a way to solve it, but I would like, I guess, in the, the naive or idealistic view of my my view of the world is I shouldn't have to have done that, right? <laughs> there are, and that, that's not a, that's not a, I guess that, that in and of itself is posing a problem to be solved, right? Is That's not a sort of a banter on any cloud provider as, as it is the, the view in between, right? In theory, I should be able to open a pipe and have a pipe open there and say, here's all my data and go. Teradrid, uh, in the network you know, between the various NSF supercomputers has been trying to do that with fast uh, FTP services, which is great FTP, great FTP <coughs> never worked right. I mean, the reliability is the issue. Right. It's a very complicated problem. It, it, it is the way to fill the pipe. All right, I think at this point, we can thank Robert here. Very nice. Hello, uh, my name is Jie Li, and today I will talk about uh, some of our experiences uh, using Windows Azure to process multi-satellite data. This project has been a cooperation between University of Virginia eScience Group, uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and Microsoft Research. So first, I'll give you some background information. So eScience today is becoming more and more data-centric uh, and data-intensive, which brings great opportunities to accelerate scientific uh, discoveries. Uh, on one hand, the, growing, the increasing data availability uh, from both large scientific instruments and those large-scale, inexpensive ground-based sensors have created an invaluable data repository to, enabling, uh, to enable new exp uh, science explorings. And on the other hand, various computational models with increasing complexities and uh, precisions are being used today to produce better scientific results. So with these great opportunities, a, national, a natural question to ask is, how can scientists easily access these tremendous volumes of raw data and apply complex computational models on this data to produce meaningful scientific results? And more specifically, uh, do scientists have sufficient computational resources access and uh, enough applications and tool support to enable them to easily manage this uh, large-scale data and the computation. If the answer is not, is not, then what could we do as 
computer scientists to help resolve this problem. So in this project, we have encountered a concrete example of this problem. And our goal is to build an application upon a, a scalable infrastructure to help, to help environment scientists to easily access, manage, and an analyze the, the large-scale remote sensing data from the MODIS satellites. To give you some basic backgrounds, uh, MODIS is short for Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer Satellite. And there are currently two MODIS satellites which are viewing the entire Earth's surface every one to two days and acquiring data in 36 spectral bands. And these data are uh, separated into multiple data products according to the surface types, such as atmosphere, land, and ocean. In general, the MODIS data are very important to, for understanding uh, the global environment and various Earth system models. However, currently, uh, scientists have a number of barriers uh, for using MODIS data in their scientific research. And the first barrier is data collection. The MODIS source data are currently uh, published and maintained on multiple FTP sites. And although these data are publicly accessible, uh, it's not easy to query uh, uh, or get a subset of the source data um, for a specific uh, area or geographic tile. Because the metadata uh, for this source are maintained separately, and there are no useful interface to support such query. And the second data barrier is, uh, the, is uh, the data heterogeneity. Um, for the different data products, uh, there are different uh, time granularities and imaging resolutions. And before scientists can uh, apply their computational models and doing analysis work on these data, uh, these different uh, uh, this uh, heterogeneous data must be transformed into a uniform format uh, for different data fields. And even worse, these, diff these different products use two different project types called SWAS and sinusoidal. And these two project types are using two uh, geographic, different geographic coordinate systems for mapping the whole entire Earth. So, uh, and also it is an extremely expensive compu computing uh, process to reproject one project type to the other. But, uh, for, but for many sci science, uh, scientists uh, who want to work on all these data products, uh, this, is a must, uh, this is a required step. So uh, we cannot avoid uh, the computation here. And finally, uh, the data management and computational resources requirement uh, is overwhelming. For example, we currently have a use case, and there is a graduate uh, environment uh, student from U uh, UC Berkeley, and his name is Yang Will, and he is currently using a new scientific model to compute a science variable uh, from the totally 10 years of data covering the whole US continent. And he's needs to get those results in order to finish his uh, dissertation, PhD dissertation, before this dry. However, the data management requirements is really huge. It involves totally five terabytes of source data, which are uh, about 600,000 files. And after we do the reprojection, in order to generate the harmonized data, there will be an extra two terabytes of data. And this whole process will take about 50,000 CPU hours of parallel computation. And the fact that this computation can be largely parallelized is important because we need to uh, scale out the computation and to use as many computational resources as we can. But still, uh, there will be a long process to finish the computation. So we built Azure Modis. Uh, which is a client plus cloud solution. And this is a MODIS data uh, processing framework we built in Microsoft Windows Azure Cloud Computing Platform. And first, we leverage the high flexibility and scalability of the cloud infrastructure and the services, 
as provided by Windows Azure. And second, uh, we leverage the unique dynamic on-demand resource provisioning capability of the cloud infrastructure in order to finish uh, the computation in a timely manner. So in this uh, data processing framework, we completely automated the data processing tasks and to, uh, which will otherwise be manually, manually done by scientists uh, to eliminate the barriers and complexities. And finally, we provide a generic uh, reduction service in which scientists can run their own arbitrary analysis executables in our service. Okay, next I'll um, uh, take an overview on the Azure Modis framework. Uh, I guess all of you have seen this slide many times, so I will just skip the basic of Windows Azure here. Okay, so this graph shows uh, the high-level overview of our data processing service. There are mainly two parts of it. The left side of the graph is the front-end uh, data service web portal, uh, for which uh, scientists or the users and developers can use to interact with the system. And the right, right side of the graph is the background computing system, uh, which includes three main stages, the uh, data collection stage and the reprojection stage, and also the, uh, finally the scientific analysis and the reduction stage. Actually, we currently have, have two sub-stages in this uh, analysis uh, step. So there are actually a four-stage pipeline uh, in the background system. And a typical uh, computation uh, run includes a series of steps. First, the scientist will submit a request uh, and in which he specify the requirements for his computation uh, through the web portal. And second, the request will be sent to the uh, job request queue in the Windows Azure system. And then further uh, processed and parsed by the service monitor, which will then dispatch a large number of parallel tasks into the task queues. And there are a number of service workers uh, working in the uh, back end. And each worker will keep pulling the tasks from the queue. And, before, and after they get a, a specific task, they will query the metadata in the Azure tables uh, in order to locate the uh, specific source data files in the external FTP sites and then download them to local storage. And these uh, specified source data are then uploaded to the Azure, Azure blob storage uh, uh, and in order to uh, cache the data for future reuse, which we'll talk about later. And then the heterogeneous source uh, data will be reprojected into a uniform format before scientists uh, can run analytical work on them. So after the reprojection, scientists, uh, when, when, when the scientist uh, submits his request, he will also upload arbitrary executables to work on the, on the data. And in this reduction st stage, the uh, worker roles will invoke these executables to do the analysis. Finally, uh, when the computation finish, uh, uh, the system will send a single download link to the results as produced by these uh, executables. So next, uh, I want to show you a short demo which uh, shows our system on, uh, on live. So this is uh, the deployment, the Azure web portal for our deployment. As, we, as you can see, there are a number of different roles. Uh, there is a web role which is hosting the web portal called Modis Data Service, and there's one instance. And also there's also a single instance service monitor, which is the master uh, of the computing system. And finally, we can see we currently have one generic worker, which is a service worker, because we currently have no computation ongoing. So we keep a minimum size of the service uh, to just maintain the availability. And now I will uh, go to the web portal and submit a test uh, request. So we can go to data reduction service and specify the years and, day and days so I, I will just choose two days and also satellites, each of them. And also the tiles is the 
the streams for the uh, geographical areas. And here we'll choose all the US tiles. And also request an email. I will use um, which is a test account. And OK, here is the step to upload the reduction executable. And we do have a test executable we got from our uh, members project and open it. Actually, there is an optional second stage uh, reduction. But here, I, we will just uh, enable a, uh, a single stage reduction. So then I will submit the request. OK, so it's just it has been sent successfully. And then we retain, uh, return to the main page. And hope, hopefully, in a few seconds, I should receive and a confirmation email from the service, which shows, OK, so I already got the new uh, notification email saying, OK, uh, the service has been, the computation has been started by the uh, background system. So now we just wait for the service to be done and then go back to the slides. And after we submit our request, so what, is, what actually happens uh, behind the scene. So actually, our uh, data processing framework is totally built on the three uh, scalable storage services of Windows Azure. So as we send a job request to the queue, uh, there is a single service monitor uh, which, will pull the, uh, which will pull the job and then pass it into a large number of parallel uh, single tasks and then dispatch them to uh, the specific task queue. And then we have a numbers uh, of generic worker roles running, and they will keep pulling the, ta the single tasks from the queue. And when they got the, a specific task, they will uh, stage in the necessary source data from the blob storages and working on them, and then produce the scientific results and send it back to the uh, blob storage place. And finally, if the whole service is done, then there will, be a down, uh, there will be a single download link sent back to the user. And also, we can see that we have persisted, persisted the, info, inf the status information of each uh, request job and uh, task and the single tasks into the Azure tables. And this will be helpful both for logging uh, our history and also help in the diagno diagnosing of our computations, which uh, I will show you later. So um, data reusing is a very common scenario in the processing of modest data. And uh, uh, so uh, currently in our system, we have implemented a two-level uh, data caching. Um, so we have uh, used we used a unique global namespace, and each data file in the blob storage has a global unique identifier. And, and so that uh, we can either pre-download or download uh, all the source files from the external FTP sites, and then cache them uh, in the blob storage for all future uh, computations to enable reuse. And also, we can compute or pre-compute all the reprojection results uh, for uh, future reuse across different runs of computations. And on the local machine level, uh, since each small size instance has around 250 gigabytes of local storage, and uh, we currently choose to cache the large size data files for reuse uh, across the tasks. Um, uh, uh, and also, uh, why don't we uh, cache all the data size? Because uh, given the 250 gigabytes, uh, it's not sufficient to cache, okay, to cache all the data. And there will be uh, some cost-related trade-offs to be made. But I will, given the time limit, I will not go through them here. Okay, so for the reduction service, uh, as we see, scientists can upload their analysis binary tools upon the request. And there are two main benefits. First, they can easily debug and refine their scientific models in their code. And secondly, uh, we can 
cleanly separate the system code debugging from the science code debugging. And we have an optional uh, second stage uh, reduction. So this graph shows uh, the scalability of our service. And we've done a series of experiments. And this, for this specific experiment, we show uh, the performance using different numbers of instances working on totally 1,500 uh, tasks. And, and also, we run the same uh, amount of tasks on a single des desktop machine. And although the desktop ma machine ca capacity is roughly double of the single uh, Azure instance, we can still roughly get 90x speed ups using 150 instances. And second, we got almost linear uh, scalability. OK, next I'll talk about uh, two important features that we think um, are the key uh, capabilities uh, provided by cloud infrastructure. First is dynamic scalability. So we currently use the Azure Management API to dynamically scale up and down instances according to workloads as to uh, improve the cost effectiveness and achieve better utilization. And if we go back to the service, to the web portal, Sorry. I think something interesting should be happening there. Because uh, as we just submit a new request, the service monitor will, ha will have the information uh, about the uh, computational requirements. OK, so, so as we can see, it's updating the deployment. This is because the service monitor is, keeps monitoring the, work, the current working, workload. And it will estimate the total computational requirements and then start up new instances in order to finish the whole computation in the uh, appropriate time deadline. So there could be some problems. Uh, and the most severe uh, problem we observed is the instance shutdown. So why is it a problem? Because currently, uh, only Azure, the Azure system, can decide which instance to shut down. So that means instances may be shut down by the, maybe randomly chosen by Azure system, and they may be shut down during task execution. That means we should either uh, provide some failure recovery mechanisms, or just wait for all instances to finish their jobs uh, before we can uh, invoke uh, the instance shutdown API. So this could be some uh, tricky issues here. And also, currently, uh, computing instance usage are charged by hours, so, uh, which means the CPU minutes will be rounded up to an integral number of hours. So it's definitely not very cost effective. We start new instance and run for 10 minutes and then shut down. And very recently, we have did some four test cases to test the performance to increase uh, instance dynamically. As, uh, for each of the test case, we increase the number of the generic worker role uh, from one to a, larger to a larger number. So we have one to 13, one to 25, 50, and then 98. And there are two interesting points. First, uh, it is generally, it, is, it takes longer to finish, to, to start uh, more instances uh, dynamically. And secondly, for all four cases, all instances, uh, Okay, all, all, all instances almost start up at the same time. This is different. This is different from what we uh, previously observed, which is, is the, an incremental startup pattern. So that reminds us we should not only uh, focus on the development of the application itself, but we should also keep an eye on the back uh, uh, cloud infrastructure. And by the way, in contrast, the shutdown time for the instances is relatively small, which is usually within three minutes. OK. Uh, another uh, important feature is fault tolerance. So tasks can fail for many reasons. Uh, for example, there can be broken or missing source data files. And also, the reduction tool may crash which, uh, uh, due to the code bugs. And finally, the failures caused by the system instability can be uh, very common uh, when computation goes in. Uh, to a larger scale. And the first two are unrecoverable uh, failures. And the third one is actually recoverable. So we have implemented a customized task uh, retry policies. 
So in short, task with timeout failures will be retried, and also task with exceptions caught uh, during the execution will be immediately resent, retried too. And also the task will be canceled after totally two retries because if it's an unrecoverable, uh, it, it does, it's not helpful, we tried it forever. So why not? So a question may be raised is why not we just use queue message visibility settings for failure recovery? But given time limit, I cannot explain here. But the sh in short, uh, it's not be able to handle all these three types of, it can only handle timeout failures, but not other types of failures. Um, Okay, so uh, I think um, to give some conclusion, uh, cloud computing, uh, we believe cloud computing provides new capabilities and opportunities for data intensive e science research. And also, uh, the dynamic scalability is a very powerful mechanism, but instance startup overhead is still not trivial uh, currently. And finally, uh, the built-in uh, built uh, fault tolerance and diagnostic features are very important uh, in the face of common failures in large-scale cloud applications and systems. And this is our list of future work. Mm, do we still get more time? Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, we plan to scale up computations from the U.S. continent to the global scale because uh, with our current system, uh, our uh, UC Berkeley graduate student could, could not only finish the 10 years of US data processing, but he can also go beyond that before this dry. And also, uh, we plan to develop and evaluate a generic dynamic scaling mechanism with uh, Azure models. Finally, we are particularly interested in evaluating the similarities and differences between our framework and also other uh, generic parallel computing frameworks such as MapReduce. All right, thank you. Thank you. Question. Questions? Yes. Um, I have two questions. Okay. But one is short and the other might be long. The first one is, I work with scientists that use time series of modus data to do analysis. So can I use your application, but I would need other kinds of uh, analysis functions? This is the first question. Uh, and uh, the second question is that they like to look at intermediate results. Yeah. How would you go about uh, doing this in this environment? Thank you for asking this two question. Uh, I didn't have enough time, but now I can explain more. So uh, yes, uh, for the first question, I think the arbitrary uh, reduction, executable upload is really powerful because by that, scientists can upload their own arbitrary ma code, okay. right? Uh, using MATLAB and other Fortran code, et cetera. So they can specify their own computational models and algorithms to work on the, this data. And the backend system is capable of providing a uniform reprojected, so they already got uh, the same format for those data points. So scientists can, uh, yeah, uh, we can uh, support any other uh, customized code to do the analysis work. And second question, I just skipped the slide here, and which is very important part of our system, and I can show you here. So after a scientist uh, can uh, send his uh, request to the system, right? And in the scenario of com cloud computing infrastructure, the user usually, usually uh, don't know how many instances are currently working on his computation. So he must be curious what the progress is during the uh, a long time. So um, actually we've implemented uh, a separate component which is for status monitoring and diagnosing. So we can just use our this uh, request for example uh, we got a unique uh, computation ID and we can use this ID to monitor the progress in real time as we can show here. Okay so from the left bar, we can show that th that's the total uh, tasks inside this computation we, we just submitted. And there are four succeeded and there are 26 processing. So this shows progressively in real time how much of the computation has been finished. And also we can even 
uh, click into the details, and we can see output log, error log, which this this uh, computation works fine, right? But if we if we uh, go to some really large scale computations, failures could happen. And okay, I've switched to a previous request and computation, which in includes almost 3,000 tasks, and we got a total failure of 37, which are unrecoverable. So we finished this computation with these failures. Is that cost accurate? Um, yeah, this, there's also an interesting feature. The, we've estimated uh, the total cost of the computation, also during runtime. And for this specific computation, it takes 121 hours. So the cost is ba currently based on the CPU hours only. So it doesn't take account into uh, network bandwidth usage and the transaction. Because uh, that's uh, an almost an, uh, uh, negligible part of the cost, because CPU is the main component of the cost. Yeah. We actually did the due diligence to compare the billing with that. And it's sufficiently close that it's round off and stuff like that. Very dead on. So this was paid on, on Marty's credit card, which was why he was yeah, so concerned in the right. last panel session about cost. Yeah, there was that 1460 no, that oh, 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 credit card. That's my Amex card. <laughs> So related to this, so you, here you're counting the CPU kind of time. As far as I understand, you cache all the original FTP files and the reprojected imaginary in Azure Blob Storage. So how big is that amount of data in terms of gigabyte that you continuously <laughs> store even when no simulation is running in this, in this scenario? So uh, for the total, for our use case, uh, 10 years data covering the US continent, and it's totally five terabytes source data from the FTP sites and two terabytes of reprojected data. So that's totally seven terabytes currently stored in the Blob storage, which will cost a thousand, uh, around a thousand dollars per month. And actually, yeah, our, our estimation is for this uh, project, uh, for this uh, use case, it will be a, there will be a time span around six months. So actually, we've estimated that the storage cost will be around $6,000. And the CPU, the computation cost is around the same. Okay. Yeah. But why we choose data caching uh, as opposed to recompute or redownload the data? Uh, because network bandwidth also costs the money. Sure. And since we Reuse is really common in our computation pattern, uh, and the reprojection process is extremely compute intensive. So it's not cost effective to reproduce the data on the fly every time. So, but the current system, for example, does not look at kind of removing files from Azure storage that have not been used for a long time, and then opportunistically just fetching them like in three months when you need them again, or something like this. Mm, we think it's. Uh, given the project time span, right, it's six months. So we think it's not, and, and our scientists are frequently using, almost uh, using all the scope of data now. So it's not, yeah, very economic. So at this point, I need to move on to the next. Okay, question. thank we, you. We can take some, some questions offline. Yeah, sure. We can talk later. So the um, last speaker, and then we'll be finishing up a little bit early because then there's a, a short break that we can have before the final round. Uh, so uh, Wen Chi Ping uh, from uh, National uh, uh, Chiatong University uh, will be giving the talk on monitoring and mining sensor data in cloud computing environments. And it's all there. Good afternoon. Everybody hear me? Okay. Yes, uh, my name is Wenji Pons, and today I will uh, present um, the works Monitoring and Mining Sensor Data in Cloud Computing Environments. And these works are joint works with uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor Yi Chi Zhen, and we are from the National Jiaotong University, Taiwan. And here is my outline. First of all, I will tell you what we developed in our projects. We, I, I will tell you uh, two, two platforms, like a Taiji platform and Harvard platform. And then I, 
And then I will tell you uh, what we do uh, to cloud this. Uh, to, to, to port these applications into the cloud computing. Our uh, first, uh, uh, in, uh, we will tell you our implementations and, uh, and some observations and issues will be raised during our implementations. And then I, finally, I will conclude with uh, this talk. Okay. So, uh, from the keynote and from the panel discussions, and we, we find that there are lots of sensors uh, available, uh, but we don't have a lot of money to buy those expensive sensors. We are focused on, in, uh, like this sensor, in, uh, much sm smaller, and it can be deployed to monitor the environments and traffic. Okay. So we can find that sensor can collect a lot, large amounts of uh, data. Then what we are doing is, is that we use this sensor to sense the physical world and collect these data into our servers. Uh, remember that I used the servers because uh, in our prior works, we, we only collect these data into one single server. But uh, we try to uh, use uh, multiple uh, servers uh, to form a, a cloud computing and try to monitor and mine uh, uh, knowledge from these sensor data. Okay. So in our schools, we have the one project called ABC. Uh, it means that always best connected cloud servers, service and access platforms. There are some sub-projects. Uh, one sub-project, of course, you, you should have the service platforms. In these service platforms, we build uh, multiple cloud computing uh, platforms. For example, we use the Hadoop, open source Hadoop versions. Uh, uh, of course, we we, we have Microsoft solutions provided by Microsoft researcher, re Research. And another, another sub-project is uh, we, we, we study the cloud device. And some professors are studies how to do the power, uh, low power issues and connectivity issues on, uh, of the cloud device. And you can see these figures. Of course, we have multiple uh, wireless uh, access interface. So some professors are studies how to uh, provide best connective uh, wireless, co wireless communications between the mobile clients and service, pla service platforms. And of course, uh, we developed some applications, wireless sensor applications. And I will tell you two, uh, two wireless sensor applications in the next slides. So here are uh, some uh, wireless sensor applications we de developed. One is uh, what we call the carbon dioxide uh, monitoring in around the National Jiaotong University. And this is the lights, the smart light. And uh, the, the, the lights will track your uh, reading behavior and change the light. And we will tell you uh, the Taiji. Taiji is the slow motion Chinese Kung Fu, and he will uh, keep you healthy and keep you mind, peace. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so if you are uh, going to Taipei, and you can find that these are all the people. And in the mornings, they will play Tai Chi in the park. Okay, so, but, but how about the young people, young people like this one? And he will use the mouse and the keyboard to click and play the, the virtual game. Okay, so we try to uh, uh, combine the physical worlds and uh, cyber worlds into one platform, what we call the cyber physical, uh, cyber physical uh, platforms. In, in this example, you can find that students, uh, there are master. Taiji's master and some students, they can be on the, uh, all, all around the world. And they, they carry the body sensor networks. And their physical information will be shown on the web, web, uh, websites, for example, the Facebook. Okay. So uh, this architecture show use the Taiji platforms. As I told you that we have the body sensor networks. And totally, there are nine sensors around the bodies, and they try to detect the movements of the user. And through the sync, the, uh, the sinks will uh, collect the sensor data and transfer those sensor data to uh, what we call the Taiji engines here. And the Taiji engines will uh, map the motions of the user. And we, uh, the, the user will uh, see other user while, uh, while the Facebook client's applications. Okay. 
So here are the details components of each each software software modules with their with develops. But we, I, I will skip this uh, slides due to the time limits. Okay, uh, this is the hardware is hardware spec. In sensor nodes, uh, we use this sensor, and we also have a sync, and the sync will have a wireless communications interface. Okay, maybe I should give you the video clip to show us how Taiji is work. Okay. Three users are at different locations. I want to play Taiji. What are Zhu and Huang doing now? Zhu is in China and Huang is in America. Let me check whether they are online on Facebook. I have not do exercise for a long time. I want to play Tai Chi. Let me check whether I can take a Tai Chi course on Facebook. I am boring now without anything to do. What are they doing now? Let me invite them to play Tai Chi on Facebook. They are online. User C creates a Tai Chi classroom on Facebook. Young people will do this one. This is so slow. User A joins this room. User B also joins this room. So you can find three the users do Tai Chi exercise at yeah. different locations. There will be one master, and other students will follow the master. Yeah. And you can find the, this is a Facebook. System, they can share their emotions with each other anywhere. Let me check whether they are online on Facebook. So there, there are only nine sensors and one six, okay. And you can, uh, if you like, you can uh, download the applications and run this application on your Facebook. Yeah. So this is the uh, Taiji's uh, uh, platforms, and we are now extend our works. Uh, uh, we, we are thinking about a more interesting uh, topic uh, to let more people join the Taiji communities. For example, so we will try to, uh, uh, to measure the similarities of different users. This one is the four sensors and from the one, one person. And the other, the other person will also have these features. And we want to try, try to formulate the similarity measurements between the user from their sensor readings. And if you have the similarity uh, measurements, then we can do a lot of the recommendations. For example, we can recommend that you should, you, uh, the user should follow one master, that who, who, uh, the, the Taiji's behaviors are very similar. OK, so another way is that we can recommend that you, you should join one uh, Taiji's communities, which are favors your style. OK, so um, this is our uh, future works. And also, so we will want to uh, use the cloud computing for Taiji's. As you can see, that the, the renderings of these, uh, the, the, their motions, they are some lag. Yeah. So we try to use the cloud computing to speed up the renderings. Yeah. And another issue is that uh, the similarities compu computations uh, amongst users are very uh, computation intensive. So we want to use the cloud computing to uh, help us to achieve these goals. Okay. But uh, this is our future work. Okay. Now uh, I will tell you another wireless sensor network about the environmental monitoring service over on the cloud computings. As you can see in these figures, that we, we have the, some vehiculars with carbon dioxide sensor and GPS sensors. And these cars are uh, have GS, uh, has 3G uh, wireless networks, and they can uh, upload or what we call the publish this sensor reading to the servers. And users from the desktops or from the other vehicular users can subscribe the service, and they can see the 
for example, in these ones, and you can see the carbon dioxide map around the National Jiaotong University. Okay. So we, uh, we, we propose these concepts, and we, we implement what we call the car web platform. In car web platforms, uh, same, these are ver, uh, some vehiculars, and they can use their smartphone or GPS logger to log the trajectories of the user and upload to our server. Then uh, the server will have the GPS data points and road segment points, and then we can use these sensor data to estimate or monitor the traffic status around the road. Uh, we, 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 we implement the car web for about two years. Okay, then this is the first version. So we use the window mobile version. This is very ugly, <laughs> <laughs> ugly uh, smartphones. And this is a window mobile six. Yeah. And then we also uh, implement Android's platform, like this one. This is a client version. And uh, you can log in to our. You, you can download the applications and run these applications on your smartphones. And as you can see these two figures, this can show you your location. And they can, uh, the user can upload their speed readings to the server. And this one shows you the nearby road segment, the traffic status around the nearby road segments. Okay, so the, red, the red lines means the traffic jams happens. Okay, then... Uh, Think about that you have the GPS uh, data points and trajectories of a user, including the history uh, GPS data points and real-time GPS data points. The problems we want to deal, deal with is that we want to estimate the traffic around the rule. Okay, so here are the problem formulations. And we, 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 we get, uh, before the problem formulations, we try to give you some assumptions. Uh, the first assumption that we have the rule network Okay, like this one. Uh, in our car web platforms, we have the road network of Taiwan. And also, we have the GPS uh, data, like this one. In this one, you can see that uh, this is one car and their location and the speed and the upload time. Okay, this, uh, the problem will be like this one. It, uh, the input will be the uh, traffic database and the queries. This queries is one row segment with the time. And the output is the speed of the query row segment. For example, in this one, uh, if we, one user want to query, uh, w want to know the traffic status on row segment E at time T4, then this is our output, 15, uh, 15 kilometer, not mile. <laughs> yeah. Then what's the problems behind, uh, uh, the prob uh, behind, behind our problems? The, the most challenging point is that, is that less traffic information in real time are available. Okay? Because not, o not always users want to share their GPS data points. Okay? So our prior work uh, uh, proposed a one spatial temporal weight approach to estimate the traffic. And these papers are published by SSTD 2009 and MDM 2009. And we observe two important uh, factors. One factor is temporal factor. Th this means that traffic always have the pattern. Okay. Then another factor is the spatial factors. Th this means that if the sensor are nearby, their readings are almost the same. For example, you can see that these are two sensors, and the speed readings are almost the same, similar. And uh, compared to this sensor, their readings, their colors are very different. Okay. So if you ha uh, have the temporal factor and spectral factor, we can retrieve more GPS data points from the database, uh, from the database and use this uh, GPS data point to estimate the traffic. Okay. I will also give you uh, one short demo, video demos. After logging into the car web website, user can browse and manage their own trajectories collected by car web client from their smartphone or PDA. 
user may click on any of them to show the whole trip on the map. By clicking on specific GPS point, the corresponding information will be provided. We can also choose road segments from the map. Our system will report estimated driving velocity. This is the entry point of our car web client. User may first log in into the server. Then the map will show up centering at current location based on the GPS signal. By default, CarWeb client will continuously track user's trajectory every 5 seconds per point and upload trajectories into the server periodically. Apart from the data collection, we also provide traffic status estimation service based on the collected history data. When the system uploads user trajectory, it actually invokes the service query simultaneously. And later on, according to the query result, drawing different colors on nearby road segments, indicating different levels of expected driving velocity. You may have noticed from this demo, the estimation query result doesn't show up instantly as we drive. The reason is our server calculation is not fast enough. So this, my student tell you the problems, that you can drive the cars, but uh, the raw segment, the, 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 the queries results are delayed. Okay. So, okay. so our problem is that given a range query like the uh, circles and how to efficiently estimate the traffic status of overall segment within the range specifies. This is computation intensive. Okay. So uh, we, we, we try to use the cloud computing to solve the problems. So uh, similar to the Google, uh, Google or uh, Microsoft Map service, we, the whole space is divided into several grids. And for each grid, we will uh, use the map reduce to estimate. You, you, for each grid, we will use one virtual machine and uh, try to find the traffic status in the grid. Okay. So this is our first uh, implementations. We just try to use HD. Uh, we try to use uh, HDFS and use the map reduce and by using ten virtual machines, and the, the result is very bad because it needs. 20 minutes and 11 seconds. So I'm, I'm wondering why, because there is no index structure there in HDFS. So uh, we, we try uh, uh, another, another uh, approach is that we try to uh, construct an index structures for the GPS data points and row segments. And also we increase the number of virtual machines. OK, so uh, we implement uh, three Three methods. Okay, one method is that we use HBase. HBase is uh, uh, open uh, database uh, on Hadoop platforms. So, so this is one. And another approach that we use HBase plus five virtual machines. And finally, uh, we break the H we do not use the HBase. We only use HDFS. But we use some uh, grid, grid uh, index data structures. Okay. But we also use five virtual machines. And this, fig this figure shows you that HBS is not good. <laughs> yeah, you can find that. Yeah. Then if you use the HDFS and fi plus five virtual machines, the, the response time, execution time is very slow. It, it's shorter. And this is also uh, show you the same result, similar result. And in this figure, th uh, we show you that with different virtual machines, if you have more virtual machines, of course, the execution times will be smaller. Also, uh, the different colors show you the different query range. If you have the uh, larger the query range, the execution times, of course, will be larger. Okay. So uh, some uh, possible issues we find. Okay. Uh, when you use the map reduce, uh, you, 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 you need to devise the file into multiple files. But the problem is that the GPS data points are not uniform distributed along, uh, uh, in, in the one space. So uh, we think that we should design uh, good methods to 
uh, divides the data file into several smaller data files according to the data distributions. Okay, so this is, uh, if you use the MapReduce, there are nine, nine mapper, okay, but sometimes you will uh, need to wait to those virtual machines with heavy load. Okay. So another possible issue is uh, we find that index structures uh, should be should be developed, okay? As we know that you can find the R trees in traditional uh, database, but how about the R trees in cloud computing environments? Okay, now then uh, you can find that Kino, our Kino tell us the, the real time sensor data. Okay, this is what we also think, the pro we also think this is a challenge problems. Okay, so uh, I conclude with this uh, talks uh, in, you can find in our uh, projects, we propose a new paradise for cloud computing, what we call the sensor cloud. And we use the sensor data to collect information of physical things and put all sensor data into cloud computing environments. And we have some uh, preliminary uh, implementations uh, for these wireless sensor networks. And we find some possible issue, for example, how to uh, divide, uh, develop or propose efficiency data storage and retrieval method and how to propose the, the partition scheme for MapReduce and also uh, deal with the real-time sensor data. Of course, uh, after this uh, Cloud Future workshops, I will let my students to try Windows Azure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I actually, I just want to comment. I really like that the use of the sensors, and I, I will probably take up time sheet with Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> uh, questions? I, I'm sure it was going to talk, and I just missed it. I apologize. But how big, how big is the data for the second half of the talk? The uh, uh, you mean uh, spatial data? GPS data? Yeah. How big? Five gigabit. Yeah. So do you try just in a dimensional relational database? Uh, yeah, but uh, the same problems. Uh, when you use the conventional database, and the response times are very slow. Yeah. Not on the order of 12 minutes, I'm sure. Uh, not. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, you, so you did test those and they came out? Yeah. What was in, in the video camera. In the video clip, you can find that uh, this is uh, use the traditional um, MySQL. Uh, you, uh, we use the MySQL. They have this. Uh, do you use it? Do you try a real database? Microsoft database. Microsoft database is not my SQL. Okay. Maybe I can try it. Yeah. So if I five if I gigabyte scale, the overhead of sort of using map reduces is yeah. a little bit. But I think like that computations is very intensive. Yeah. It like like the uh, ro uh, the renderings of the map service on the Google Maps or Microsoft Map, you can find that they use the cloud computers. But in our problems, it's more uh, difficult because you have the GPS data points. Uh, we, we, we need to estimate the traffic uh, of all uh, row segments within the query range. So the challenge will be the computation. Yes. Do I have time for a... Yes. Uh, there are lots of people in the spatial database community that keep coming up with new algorithms to speed up these nearest neighbor queries and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. do you believe that uh, this will kind of disappear when you start running on the cloud? So you won't need to have so many uh, very, very small modifications and algorithms to achieve a very small a performance improvement once you start running on the block. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to uh, try to to say that um, in uh, of course uh, there are lots of the uh, research works on traditional uh, spatial queries mm -hmm. uh, uh, on database, a yes. traditional database. But the cloud cloud platforms are the cost model of plaf, uh, cloud platforms are different from the traditional database. Mm -hmm. So this. Uh, traditional spatial query should be redesigned. Yeah. So this is just uh, the, the first try, and we will continue to work. And uh, I hope that Cloud DB uh, will be developed. Yeah. Just a try. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all in 10 minutes.